In this video, we're going to talk about a special kind of power series called a Taylor series, which has a special case called the Maclaurin series. So we're going to start by assuming we have a function which has a power series representation. So it has essentially this infinite sum that looks like a polynomial. We could determine the power series if we could just find out what these coefficients are. Well, we can see if I put x equals 0 into both sides of this equation here, I can find out that c sub 0 must be f evaluated at x equals 0. So I've got one of the coefficients. Well, if I take the derivative, I'll get f prime of x, and now I'll start at c1 because the derivative of a constant will be 0. And then all of my powers of x have been reduced by 1 because I've applied the power rule. And now I can substitute x equals 0 again into the derivative expression. And now I've got a value for c1. I've got c sub 0, c sub 1. Well, I don't want to have to do this all the time. Let's see if we can find a pattern. Let's take the derivative again. So we'll get the second derivative of f of x. And now we're going to start with, well, 2c2. And then we'll apply the power rule to the remaining terms. Now I'm not going to multiply these out for a reason, because I'm looking for a pattern. Well, if I put 0 in the place of x again into the second derivative, I'll find that c sub 2 is 1 half the second derivative of f evaluated at 0. So I'm not quite seeing the, a pattern here yet. My first one was just the function evaluated at 0. My second coefficient was the derivative evaluated at 0. The third coefficient, which is c sub 2, is half of the second derivative of f evaluated at 0. So let's repeat this process a few more times. Let's go ahead and take the derivative one more time. So I'll have the third derivative of f of x. And I'll apply the power rule to the terms that I had in the second derivative. Let's go ahead and set that equal to 0 now. Set x equal to 0 on each side. And I'll get that c3 is 1 over 3 times 2 times the third derivative of f evaluated at 0. OK, I'm starting to see a bit of a pattern. Let me do one more time, one more derivative. So I'll have the fourth derivative. Now, when we start to get to higher order derivatives, we stop using this prime notation, and we use a superscript with just a, an index in it. So this f super 4 in parentheses indicates the fourth derivative of x. So I just apply the power rule. My first term is going to be 2 times 3 times 4 times c4. And then I have the power rule applied to the remaining terms, which gives me c4 as 1 over 4 times 3 times 2 times the fourth derivative of f evaluated at 0. So I think we have a pattern here. That fourth coefficient there, c sub 4, actually it's the fifth coefficient, but c sub 4, 1 over 4 times 3 times 2, that's 4 times 3 times 2 is just 4 factorial. That's a lot easier to write down. So we, the c sub 4 is the fourth derivative of f evaluated at 0 divided by 4 factorial. Well, c sub 3 is just the third derivative of f evaluated at 0 over 2 factorial. And in fact, 1 over 2 is the same as 1 over 2 factorial. So c sub 2 
is the second derivative of f evaluated at zero over two factorial. And the first derivative or c sub one, then would be the first derivative of f evaluated at zero over one factorial, since one factorial is one. So in general, we have a formula then for our coefficients. c sub n will be the nth derivative of f evaluated at zero over n factorial. And in fact, uh, we consider the zeroth derivative of a function as just being the function value itself. And we said that zero factorial equals one. So this formula also works for the very first coefficient c sub zero. Now that was a power series centered at x equals zero. If I have it centered at x equals a, I can repeat the same process. The only difference is that I have to substitute x equals a instead of x equals zero, but I'll get a similar formula for my coefficients. I'll just have f evaluated at a instead of f evaluated at zero. And when I write that out, this expression here with these coefficients or this formula for the coefficients is the Taylor series of f centered at a. Now the Taylor series of f centered at zero, which is what we saw first, is a very special case and it's so common that it has its own name. It's known as the Maclaurin series of f. So let's find the Maclaurin series of f of x equals e to the x. This one is really easy to find because all the derivatives, all the higher order derivatives are the same as the original function value. They're all equal to e to the x. And so our formula then for the nth coefficient would just be e to the x evaluated at zero over n factorial should just be one over n factorial. So the Maclaurin series for e to the x is just the sum of n equals zero to infinity of x to the power of n over n factorial. And that's just one plus x plus x squared over two factorial plus x cubed over three factorial plus x to the fourth over four factorial and so on. And in fact, if I choose x equal to one, this gives us another way of calculating the number e. e is going to be the sum from n equals zero to infinity of all the uh, reciprocals of the factorials. So I'd have one plus one plus a half plus one over three factorial plus one over four factorial and so on. Let's try to find the Maclaurin series of sine of x. Now here the derivatives aren't all equal to each other. So let's make a table. So remember the zeroth derivative is just the function value. And sine at zero, sine of zero is just zero. Take the first derivative and I'll get cosine of x. And cosine of zero is one. Take the der derivative of cosine of x, I'll get negative sine of x. So that would be the second derivative of f of x. And again, sine of x is zero, so I, I got a zero coefficient again. All right, take the third derivative. Well, that would just be the derivative of negative sine of x, which is negative cosine of x. And so uh, when I put zero in, I'll get negative one. Take the fourth derivative and I'm back at sine of x. And I think you remember that we're just going to see a cycle of these four functions as I continue taking derivatives, which means that I'll see a cycle of these four values when I evaluate the derivative at x equals zero. And so that would say 
that sine of x would be well 0 plus 1 times x plus 0 over 2 factorial times x squared minus 1 over 3 factorial times x cubed. And now we repeat. It'll be 0 over 4 factorial x to the fourth uh, plus 1 over 5 factorial x to the fifth plus 0 over 6 factorial x to the sixth. And then it would be minus uh, 1 over 7 factorial plus x to the seventh. So you can write that in summation notation, which is just saying we're only going to have odd powers of x starting with a positive x to the first, and then we alternate. So we get an alternating series here. Positive x to the first minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial minus x to the seventh over 7 factorial, and so on. Now, this Maclaurin series only has odd powers of x. The Maclaurin series for sine of x only has odd powers of x. Well, that makes perfect sense because sine of x is an odd function. So it should only have odd powers of x. So we know the Maclaurin series for e to the x and for sine of x. What about cosine of x? Well, we could uh, go back and make a table just like we did with um, sine of x. But let's make use of what we already did and the fact that cosine of x is just the derivative of sine of x. So if I take the derivative of the power series for sine of x, I should get the power series for cosine of x. So let's write out you know, the first few terms. Take the derivative of each term. And there's a clear pattern here as I apply the power rule. I have 3x squared over 3 factorial, 5x to the 4th over 5 factorial, 7x to the 6th over 7 factorial. So of course, you know, just a reminder, 7 factorial I could write as 7 times 6 factorial. So this 7 will divide out and I'll be left with 6 factorial in the denominator. And the same thing here, I'll have even numbers. I made a mistake here. This says 8 factorial. This should have said 9 factorial. Let me clean that up. So I'll be left with just even powers of x with the corresponding even factorial in the denominator. Make my correction. And here again, it makes perfect sense that cosine of x should only have even powers of x because cosine is an even function. All right, so we've got a formula for the Taylor series and Maclaurin series. But the, we had a, a very important assumption. We assumed that f of x had a power series representation. Well, how can we be sure that the Taylor series is an actually representation for f of x? We said that if we have a power series representation, then it should look like the Taylor series. But how do we know that it actually is valid? What would be the interval of convergence? Maybe it's only convergent at the center, at x equals a. Maybe it's convergent for all values of x. Well, this is actually a kind of a hard question to answer, but we can get a pretty good idea um, by looking at the Taylor polynomials. 
Now, Taylor polynomials are just, they are polynomials. They're just the partial sums of the Taylor series. So my zeroth degree Taylor polynomial would just be the constant f evaluated at a. The first degree Taylor polynomial, we've seen this before, f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a. In calculus one, we learned that that is the tangent line approximation of f of x. Then the second degree Taylor polynomial would go out to uh, x minus a squared, and so on, third degree Taylor polynomial. And so the again, the nth degree Taylor polynomial is just the nth partial sum of the Taylor series. All right, well, we're going to make use of these Taylor polynomials, and um, we're going to look then at the residual. What is the difference between the function and the Taylor polynomial? The Taylor polynomial should be an approximation of the function, at least you would expect near the center. That's what we learned in calculus one, that the first degree Taylor polynomial which is the tangent line approximation, is a good approximation of the function when x is close to a. So you would expect that the nth degree Taylor polynomial would be a good approximation of the function when x is close to a. And in fact, you would ex want to have the remainder here get really small uh, as n goes to infinity, if the Taylor polynomial actually represents uh, the uh, function. So really, our question now is, how can we determine when or for what values of x does the remainder function go to zero as n goes to infinity? Well, we're going to make use of a uh, special function that we're going to construct for each value of n, and we're going to construct that function uh, and make use of Rolle's theorem with that function. Well, if you forgot Rolle's theorem, it's just a special case of the mean value theorem. It says that if you have a function that's continuous on a closed interval and differentiable on an open interval. And the function value is the same at both endpoints. Then we have to know that there's a number C between A and B where the derivative is equal to zero. So we're going to define a function. So for each value of x, we're going to get a number. And I'm going to call it r2 because I'm going to start with really a uh, second degree representation of f of x. So I'm going to say that f of x is this tangent line approximation plus a remainder. Now, this isn't the same remainder as we looked at before because I'm taking, that's why I'm using lowercase r. I'm going to take this lowercase r, divide it by 2, and multiply it times x minus a squared. So I could solve this for r sub 2 of x and get the following expression. So r sub 2, for each x, I'm getting a number, r sub 2. So r sub 2 is a function of x. And it's going to satisfy this equation here. The top equation is what I'm going to be looking at. Now I'm going to uh, define a new function, uppercase f. It's related to lowercase f. It's going to depend on a new variable or new parameter z. And the way I'm going to define it is as follows. z is going to take the place of a in 
my Taylor polynomial up here. So now I've got z is the variable, x is a fixed number. So x is a fixed number, z is the variable. So f, my lowercase f, it depends on z, it changes with z, and uh, uppercase f depends on z, and of course x minus z is also a function of z. And I bring that up because what I want to do is take the derivative. And so the derivative of lowercase f of z would just be f prime of z. But the derivative of lowercase f prime of z times x minus z is the product of two functions of z. So I'll need to use the product rule. So I'll get the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second now with respect to z the derivative of x minus z remember x is being is, is fixed x is a constant now so the derivative would just be negative one and then when i take the derivative of the last term I just use the power rule and the chain rule because I'm taking the derivative with respect to z. So the 2 will come out in front, divide out with the 2 in the denominator, and then I'll get negative because the derivative of the inside is negative 1. All right, so we have the derivative, and that can actually be simplified. We can factor out the x minus z here. Uh, notice that I have a f prime of z, and then I have f prime of z times negative 1. So I really am only left with two terms, and those two terms have a common factor of x minus z. All right. So this is a very strange function, I agree. And you're probably wondering, why did we construct this function uppercase f? Well, notice one thing, that uppercase f evaluated at a gives me, well, f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a plus r2 of x over 2 times x minus a squared. That is exactly the formula for f of x that we started out with. So f, uppercase f evaluated at a, gives me f of x. And uppercase f evaluated at x, well, if I put x in the place of z, the second term and the third term are 0, and I'm only left with uppercase f of x equals lowercase f of x. So now, uppercase f has the same value when z equals a and when z equals x. So by Rolle's theorem, there has to be a number, c2. And I'm going to call this number c2 because this corresponds with r2. It corresponds with the last term being squared. So there's a number C2, which is between X and A. We don't know which one is bigger. X might be bigger than A, or A might be bigger than X, but it doesn't matter. The C2 is going to be between X and A, such that F prime of C2 equals zero. Well, F prime is this expression. So if I put c2 in the place of z, that is going to equal 0. And so that would tell me that this term has to be equal to 0. So that my r2 of x, which will make this an uh, equation, in any e e true statement, can be defined as the second derivative of f evaluated at this number c2. And so we could actually say then that the remainder, 
the capital R sub 2 of this uh, Taylor polynomial, the first degree Taylor polynomial, would be f double prime of c2 over 2 times x minus a squared. So we actually have for the first degree Taylor approximation or first degree Taylor polynomial, now we know exactly what the remainder is. Okay, we don't know what c2 is, but we have an expression. We know that c2 is some number between x and a. Does this same analysis hold for, say, maybe the second degree Taylor polynomial? Can I find an expression for the remainder using the same analysis? And the answer is yes. Uh, again, for any value of x, I can define a function. Now here I'm going to put a subscript on the uppercase f. I'm going to get a f sub 3, which is a function of z. And now all I do is just replace my a value with the z. I can go ahead and take the derivative there. I'll have to use the product rule like I did before with both the second term and the third term. And again, of course, the f prime of z will add out with f prime of z times negative 1. The f double prime of z times x minus z is going to add out here. And I have a mistake. Let me make that. Mistake. This shouldn't be a plus. This should be a minus. Oops. And so that I'm left with only terms that have the x minus z squared over 2. And I can factor that out. Let me make my correction again. And again, this function uppercase f sub 3 is constructed, so we can use Rolle's theorem. So f sub 3 of a is f of x, and f sub 3 of x is also f of x. So now we can use Rolle's theorem. We'll find a number c sub 3 between x and a. Such that the derivative of uppercase f evaluated at c3 uh, is going to equal 0. Which will say, OK, now I know an expression for this lowercase r3 of x. It's just the third derivative of f evaluated at this number c3, which I get from Rolle's theorem. And so now I have an expression here for my remainder, capital R sub 3, for my second degree Taylor polynomial. And so in general, I mean, as it works for the first degree, it works for the second degree, it'll work for the nth degree Taylor polynomial. So for each value of x, I can find a number c sub n such that, and that's going to be a number between x and a such that the difference between the nth degree Taylor polynomial and the function is going to be the n plus first derivative of f evaluated at this number c sub n all over n plus 1 factorial times x minus a to the power of n plus 1. So this is our uh, expression then for r sub n. r sub n then is this number c sub n between x and a, um, which is going to be input to the 
n plus 1 derivative of f, we divide that by n plus 1 factorial, multiply that times x minus a raised to the power of n plus 1. Okay, well that was a lot of work. How does that help us answer the original question? Well, we want to know how can we determine when the remainder goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. If I take the absolute value of each side of this expression, I, get an in, I can get an inequality if the n plus 1 derivative is bounded. So if I have a positive number m, where the n plus 1 derivative of f is bounded by m, so smaller than or equal to m, for all x which are close to a. Now I say close, but in some cases, you know, this d value really uh, is, is infinite. The um, Maclaurin series or Taylor series is convergent for all values of x. But certainly for some positive value of d, uh, if we have a positive number, uppercase m, where the n plus 1 derivative of f is bounded by m, when I'm that close to the center a, then the remainder is going to satisfy the following inequality. If I take the absolute value of both sides here, I can replace the absolute value of f of the n plus 1 derivative of f evaluated at cn with my capital letter m, and then the rest of the terms stay the same. I just need the absolute value of x minus a. So now we should be able to say that, uh, and of course this inequality is only valid when uh, the m value is valid. And to show this in uh, our examples, we're going to use this useful fact, which we've uh, kind of proven earlier, uh, but uh, we'll just take it as a fact here that if I take any fixed value of x, x to the value x to the power of n over n factorial goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. So let's show that the Maclaurin series for sine of x it gives us the exact value um, for all values of x. That's the equivalent of saying that the limit as n goes to infinity of the remainder goes to 0. So take any value of a as your center. We know that the uh, nth derivative of sine is either going to be uh, plus or minus sine of x or plus or minus cosine of x. In any case, if you put any value of uh, of a in there, and I guess I should have said that this was a, the absolute value of that uh, number is going to be less than or equal to 1 because sine and cosine both have a range of negative 1 to positive 1. And so now let's go ahead and apply Taylor's inequality with our capital M equal to 1. So our remainder then would be x, the absolute value of x minus a to the n plus 1 power over n plus 1 factorial. And we just said that, okay, well, x minus a is some real number. And so for uh, any value of x, any value of a, that is going to go to 0 as n goes to infinity. And so it follows that the remainder goes to 0 as well. So I'm going to stop this video now and work out some more examples in a separate video.